everybody. Welcome to This Podcast Needs a Title. I am Erica Davis. And I'm Isabel Sterling. And today we are joined by author Allie Malinenko. Allie is a poet, novelist, and librarian living in Brooklyn, New York, where she pens her tales in a secret writing closet. Allie, uh, we're coming back to that in a minute. Before dawn each day. Connect with Allie on our website at AllieMalinenko.com. Allie, welcome. Blah, blah, blah. Great to have you. I love you. What is your secret writing closet, please? Okay, so... When Ghost Girl and This Appearing House were written, this was accurate. It is no longer accurate because I have since moved, and now I have a whole entire room. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm, you're right. I upgraded. <laughs> I was like, look at me. I can put my arms out. This is great. <laughs> um, Wait, like literal closet then? Okay. It was a, it was a literal walk-in closet. So okay, in my old in. apartment, in my old apartment off the living room was a small, like you could walk in and basically like, if you put your arms out, you touch all, you could touch all four walls. The people who had lived there beforehand built bookshelves into on one of the walls. There was Ooh. shelving. They might've used it as a pantry. I don't know, but there were shelving. And then there was an empty space below that. And I was like, that's for my desk. Oh my God. And I immediately like moved into my little tiny secret fall in the wall closet so now i can stretch out and cry on the floor which is great it's God, much better amazing. for my lower back <laughs> all right so ali it's nice to meet you thank you for being on the podcast um thank you i always me. like yeah so fun i would love to know we're going to sort of take this in, in two pieces what got you into writing and then what made you want to make the shift to publishing Ooh, that's a good question i like that um so i I started writing stories as a kid. The very first one I remember writing, I was like eight years old and it was eight pages long, which I thought was like definitely novel Perfect, size, yes. right? It was <laughs> huge. I was so impressed with myself. Um, and it was absolutely about a kid who gets hit by a drunk driver. And my parents were like, hmm, dark, Ellie, dark for an eight year old. Yeah, 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 yeah. But so that, like, that, that, that explains the, the the middle grade horror. Part. It's, it's always been there. It's always been yeah. lurking around in the back of my brain. Um <laughs> And then I wrote a lot of angsty poetry in high school, as nice. teenagers are wont to do. And then I shift gears to some short stories, and then I finally started working on novels. And then I published with a few small presses before I, I took, I'm going to try for traditional publishing, mm -hmm. leap into the unknown. And whew, it's been a doozy. For sure. I'm actually curious, what was the thing where you were like, you know what, novel length, like I want to write a novel, like what was that moment? I had put together a collection of short stories, um, which I never wound up doing any. And I don't know. I, it just, it's, it's like the white whale, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's just like, can I do this? Could I possibly do this? And like the very first one that I wrote was a middle grade fantasy. Like mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't think adult. I didn't even think YA. I did do some YA later, but the very first book that I published and it, it was published in a small press um, that end landed me an agent, not my current one, but a previous one. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I just, um, it was a middle grade fantasy about a girl who finds out she is the only living descendant of Shakespeare. So I had a lot of Greek mythology because, you know, I don't know, Percy Jackson was a thing. <laughs> but yeah, people were really into Greek mythology for a while, so. Yeah, I feel like that it comes in waves. Like I was a kid, it <laughs> yeah. was like... It's probably in the 90s. It was very like big at that point, or at least it was for me. Yeah. I don't know yeah. if it was in the wider world. The internet wasn't really a thing yet. <laughs> Sweet summer children that we all were. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned doing some small press and then sort of making the leap over. I'm curious, like what actually initially what was like why for the small press? And then what was it like? Yeah, I want to like go to this big wacky world of traditional publishing. Ooh, so I went with small presses at first because the idea of trying to get representation seemed impossible to me mm -hmm. um like I just I felt like I had it I had a I had a YA book called this is Sarah which came out on a small press um which I think is out of print now it was a it was a story about a kid whose girlfriend goes missing because everything I write is dark yeah. and he <laughs> sort of has like a complete like mental breakdown and is convinced that she is calling him I didn't think it was commercial enough but I really liked the story and so I went with a small press and they were great, but like small presses disappear. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. their nature. It's what happens. Like it's, you just have to know that going into it. And then I worked for seven years on a single book that was a science fiction YA story called Palimpsest, Ooh. which 
was a story about a bunch of like, like a found family group of kids uh, in New York City. And the major driving storyline was a, I'm not, I can't believe I'm saying this out loud. It was a, a magical chess tournament. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. What what was magical about it? If you don't mind giving spoilers. So while you work through like the the levels of competition on this magical chess tournament, gained capacity to manipulate physics. Oh, oh fun. Yeah. it was a lot. It, was, it got me it got me my agent, which was very cool. How did um, I get you, Rena? I sent it to a bunch of people. I queried Rena. Um, she wrote me back like right away and she was like, send me the first 50 pages, you know, the whole spiel. And I was like, okay. And then really soon she was like, send me the whole thing. And I was like, okay. And then I think like six weeks later, she wrote me back. And so I get up to write early in the morning. Now Rena's office is in Israel. So we have a very big time delay. Yeah. Yeah. But I write very early in the morning when it's like not very early for her. So I woke up one morning to write and I got an email from her and it was a rejection. And she was basically like, listen, I loved everything in this, but the ending isn't working. So I'm going to have to pass. And I was like crushed. Oh. And I went to go talk to my husband and I was like, so Rena passed on it. And he was like, well, what'd she say? And he was like, why don't you ask her what she thinks like could be changed? I was like, I can't ask her that. I can't. She rejected. I can't ask her anything. He was like, you could though. Like if she doesn't email back, she doesn't email that back. So I wrote her back and I thanked her for her time and like her her very nice letter. And I and I did. I was like, you know, just out of curiosity, if you know, if you have time, I would love to hear your feedback about what you think isn't working. And she sent me this giant detailed email. Like, so this is my shoot your shot moment, friends. Yeah, like, yeah. It's yeah. so worth oh, it yeah. to just ask because worst case scenario, she never answered. That would have been it. Right. But she sent this super detailed email. Oh. At the end of which was like, if this makes sense to you, and this is the direction you want to put, like send the book in, send it back to me after you do. And I was like, oh my God. So I did. I spent another like six months working on it and I sent it back to her. Wait, I just and, want to pause you and yeah. just point out that you spent six months doing that. So many people think mm. that like, oh my God, like I got an R&R, like I have to do it. And they turn it around in like two weeks. or So I just want to like have everybody listen and hear that like six months to truly deeply revise and, you know, move the book in a different direction. Like that's huge. So many people don't have the patience for that. And I think that's really, really key. Well, that is also credit to Rena because in her letter, she very much was like, this is not a race. Mm, I want this book good. to be as best as you can That's take your time. Awesome. I'm not going yeah. anywhere. I'm not going to forget about like just this whole very like, because I was like, oh my God, I can maybe what, like two weeks, three weeks. And, and so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll take my time. And I did. So it went, so then another agent who had the original made an offer. And this, this is where it got real weird. Yeah. So this other agent made an offer and then was like, I was like, well, let me let the other agents who still have it know that I have an offer. And she's like, okay, you have 24 hours to get back oh, to me. That's some nonsense right there. Mm -hmm. So I panicked Damn. and then I wrote Rena and Rena's like, so I'm on vacation with my family. I don't <laughs> think I can turn this around in 24 hours. And also that is not industry standard. So Correct. please be careful. So I wrote the agent back and I explained that some of the people said they can't do that turnaround time. And because they've put some effort into this, I really want to give them the space to be yeah. able to make their decision so I can make a decision I want. And the offering agent rescinded the offer, accused me of a whole host of things like Ooh, that. I, I wasn't being up front. Like she was acting as if we had an exclusive and we didn't like right. at all. I was like, oh, I had an offer. And then I dropped it on the floor and it broke into a million pieces, which was technically a good thing because it was not an yeah. offer I wanted. I dodged a bullet for sure. And then Rena came back and was like, OK, so I love the new version. You want to do this? And I was like, I sure do. So it was, is that ghost girl that you're talking about? It sure is not. So plot really? twist, it plot died twist. on submission. Yep. Been there. This is why people are like, what was your journey into publishing like? And I'm like, it was fraught. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> the only <laughs> word I have. Even the people who start out without the frauds, like publishing can't help but be fraught. Yes. Mm -hmm. like it's yeah. in its nature. So you got it up on the front end. Some people get it later on, but like. No, publishing was absolutely like, hey, welcome to the industry. We're cuckoo bananas. Let's go. Yes. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, yeah. okay. We went on submission and we were on submission for an entire year. And every imprint you could possibly think of said, no, thank you, please. And I was uh, devastated. 
Yeah. Because I was like, wow, like I, because when you think about it, you're like, oh, okay. And this is another thing that I think people need to understand about publishing is that like, you think a door is, op- when a door opens, it stays open, but that is not always the case. Mm-hmm. And most times it's not the case. So mm-hmm. it's like, I got the agent, but that doesn't mean I get a deal. And I didn't get a right. deal. And then like later when you do get a deal, it doesn't mean you're going to get a second deal right. or a third deal. Like nope. the door shuts every time and you've got to get back in the room. So we decided, so it was on sub. It got rejected by every house. Um, I, where did I leave off? Oh, crying on the floor. So I was crying on the floor Aww. at like five in the morning. And I was like, okay, either I write something completely new or I quit because yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I clearly am not cut out for this. So I was like, okay, what were your favorite stories when, you know, you were a kid? Cause I was like, I don't even want to touch YA again. Like after seven years is a long time on one book. Yeah. Yes, so I was is. like, I don't know. <laughs> um, and I was like, okay, so either I'm going to quit or I'm going to write something completely new. And I was like, what were the books that meant the most to you when you worked? Like, when did books mean the most to you? And I was like, that would be mm. middle grade for sure. Mm-hmm. And what kind of stories meant the most to you? And I was like, scary stories. And then I sat down and I wrote Ghost Girl in six months and I sent it to Rena and she wrote me back like two hours later and she said, it's your debut. Oh my oh, God. So was it? Oh it my was God. So good. Oh my God. Oh, I just got chills. That's awesome. Rena, yep. shout out to you and your instinct and amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's how that happened. It was, like I said, it was a lot of ups and downs. It was crazy. Can you tell yeah. us more about Ghost Girl? And Isabel and I agree, gorgeous cover, by the way. Yes. Holy yes. blessed Crap. by the cover guy. I, I was blessed. My illustrator, uh, her name's Makey. Uh, she lives in Germany. And when my editor was like, okay, so we picked the illustrator, she contacted me and was like talk to me about this book she's like i you know i'm reading it but like talk to me about what 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 parts of this story matter the most to you and like we had this like amazing conversation and she pulled up like five different incredible sketches and like my editor was like let's vote and we all picked and i got to be so involved in the process i've heard stories of are like writers who are just like they're like here this is your cover and they hate it there's nothing they can do but -hmm. like yeah, no, HarperCollins was wonderful about that. And and Mickey was amazing about making sure that, like, I was involved, which she didn't have to do. She's the artist. Um, so Ghost Girl is a story of Z Puckett and her best friend, Elijah, and her bully turned buddy, Nellie. It, it's a story about it's a story about what friendship can mean. Um, and how it can save you. Uh, mm-hmm. And what happens in the story is that the new principal comes to town and he has this capacity. He's like a, he's a very devilish kind of mm-hmm. character. And he has this capacity to invent, like to figure out what everybody truly secretly wants and give it to them. And then while he does that, he like siphons all their energy. Oh, hell. so the whole town oh. is like sort of getting drained. And yeah. so the kids have to figure out what's happening. And then while this is going on, Z discovers that she can see ghosts. And so they enlist some help from some ghosts. And it's very much a story about bullying. And it's not just like, yes, like Nellie and Z bully each other, because I think it's also important to talk about like, sometimes when you're bullied, you bully back. But also like Elijah's father is a bully. He doesn't think he is, but Elijah is a heavier kid and he makes comments about Mm. his weight all the time. And it's like, so it's very much about that. And it's about, you know, sticking together, you know? Kids on bikes. Follow up. Is there any chance that Nellie is named after Nellie Olson? You better believe she is. Oh, Four that's amazing. You better believe she is. there a better bully name than Nellie? Come no, on. It was the first thing I saw when I, I mm-hmm. heard that her name was Nellie. I'm like, that's yep. Nellie Olson. Yep. I just wanted to take a quick, quick detour. So you told us a little bit about Ghost Girl and how that came to be. I'm curious from, you know, as a fellow author, and writing on deadline can be very different than writing off deadline. So I'm wondering, like, what was the story with the Superior House in terms of, like, was it part of the debut deal? Then you had to write it under deadline. Was it totally separate? Like, what was the story with that one? Uh, it was not. Ghost Girl was an, an individual okay. book that was bought. It was a one book deal. It was uh, very much like it's a standalone, mm-hmm. which is good. I didn't want to do a series. I mean, I, 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 I could have seen a way to make it a series, but like... I would have been bored by book two. I know that about myself. So I'm really glad they were into it being a standalone. So while um, Ghost Girl was out on submission, because I do what everybody says to do, which is write the next thing. Yeah. I wrote The Spearing House. Um, And Mm -hmm. then 
Ghost Girl got accepted, and then I did my revisions. I sent this appearing house to my agent. I made her cry a lot, and <laughs> she sent it to my editor. And like two weeks later, I got another offer. Hell yeah! It was oh, like yeah, it was nice. really fast Allie. turnaround. Yeah, so it was like an option. It was like more like the option, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It was like the next middle grade horror they get first dibs at. It's like I said, you you had the turbulence at the top, and then you had a couple of easier submission periods, and then there'll yep. probably be more turbulence. It's just how this I mean, goes. I can't wait. It's cuckoo bananas. That's why. <laughs> so you were able to write all of The Superior House before it sold. So has you, have you since written a book, like you sold on like a partial that you've had to then first draft on deadline? So I'm currently doing exactly that very thing. So mm-hmm. I sold a book, which we haven't signed the contract yet. I think it's supposed to be soon. So it hasn't been announced yet. So I can't say too much about it, but like, I don't know if you follow me on Twitter, you know what it is. I am writing on deadline, but literally my deadline is May 1st of 2024. I have a full entire year, so I'm not stressing. It's not, I'm I'm halfway done with the book anyway. It's not going to take me that long. See, I say this out loud and the universe is like, is it going to take you that long to finish though, Allie? The fuck it will. <laughs> it is now, bitch. Look, we sold it on a partial. Great. It's like three chapters or something and a synopsis. Okay, so the book is about grief and um, I'm very much grieving and I may be possibly not ready to write this, but I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> Allie, I have been following that Twitter journey for about a year with you talking about it. And it's like, mm-hmm. everybody, if you don't follow Allie on Twitter already, please do. It's especially if you are also grieving because watching her talk to herself out loud in the tweets, which is all Twitter is for any <laughs> of us. Don't be alarmed. It's like, wow, get out of my head, Allie Milanenko. <laughs> Since you and I do know each other through grief and through Twitter, does this appearing house deal with grief as well? It deals with trauma more than grief. It's really more, it's more about trauma and the elasticity of trauma. I mean, it's grief in the sense, not as in like the loss of a person that you love, but it's the loss of stability. It's the loss of the life you thought you were having is no longer the life you're currently having. So this appearing house is my cancer book. Yeah. I was diagnosed with cancer in 2014 and I wrote like a collection of poetry called Better Luck Next Year. About that whole experience. And I was like, okay, tip top, all done talking about the cancer. Did that thing, check that box, move it along. (laughs) And then years later, my trauma was like, hello, let me in. We have more to talk about. Oh, man. And I was like, okay, so I knew I wanted to write a haunted house story, which is what this is. And the thing about haunted house stories is that haunted houses are often stories used for representation of minds that are either diseased or ill at ease Mm -hmm. or not functioning the way you want them to be functioning, however you want to see that. And I was like, well, what if the house wasn't a mind? What if it was a body? So the general Mm, story of this peering house is about a girl named Jack. Um, She's just moved from California to Jersey with her mom. Uh, She had been diagnosed at six years old with a brain tumor. She is now 12. So she's hitting that, that uh, she's about to be 12. So she's hitting that five-year marker. And there's, I don't know if, I don't know if this is common knowledge, so I'll just put it out there. There's like a thing in cancer circles where like these certain anniversaries have meaning. They don't really have meaning, but they do have meaning because it's like they're doctor goals. So it's like when they talk to you about your chance of remission, it's when it's always in the next five years, your chance of remission is X. I'm sorry, your chance of recurrence of it coming back is X. Okay. Okay. In the next five years, your chance of recurring is X. In 10 years, your chance of recurring. So they chunk it up in this time. So even though five years doesn't mean anything, it feels like it means something. So that's where Jack is. And at the same time, she is having some trouble. She's, she's had a fall off her bike. She thinks she's seeing things. Um, and she's afraid that they're all symptoms. And so is her mom. And her mom is very hovering, worrying, Mm -hmm. you know, my daughter almost died on me, you know, kind of mom. A house appears out of nowhere at the end of the cul-de-sac where she rides her bike, brings her best friend down there to make sure that he can see it too. And he's like, yeah, but like, who cares? I don't know what this house is. Somebody must've built a house. He just didn't notice. And she's like, no, it literally wasn't here yesterday. The neighborhood bullies dare them to go in they go in and then they can't get back out it's not that it doesn't open when it opens and you go through it you are back in the living room so they can't get out of the house and the house eventually starts to talk to jack and the she learns as she goes from room to terrifying room where terrible things happen and i wrote some really disgusting things about teeth that no i had to do a reading at stoker and i was like well i should read from the superior house because it got nominated 
And I was like, I'm going to read the teeth scene. <laughs> and I finished. And I'm reading to adults who read horror regularly. And I looked up and people were like, oh. Ew. <laughs> Stoker, for anybody who doesn't know, is oh. StokerCon, where Allie was a finalist. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Yes, yes. So anyway, so eventually she learns that the house exists for her and the only way out is through and she has to face the thing that she's most afraid to face. So it's very much about like facing your mortality. It's, yeah. it's understanding that just because something terrible happened to you doesn't mean that it, it you will always be in this space. So I guess <laughs> that could tie a little bit into grief. Um, but yeah. no, the book that I'm currently writing is The Big Grief Baby. And I will I will say this too, just for anyone. Um, I call it a cancer book. The word cancer is said exactly one time. This is very much a book about trauma. I have I had some people reach out to me who were survivors of sexual assault and they were like, I know that house. I've been trapped in that house too. Yeah. I wrote it to have a universality to it because I didn't as much as I like wanted to be like you know, big fuck you to the fault in our stars. Cause that book sucks. Ew. <laughs> Don't read it. It'll piss you off. Yep. I didn't want, I wanted to write something that wasn't like specifically about like my very specific experience yeah. of like, I got cancer and you know, this is what it felt like. You know, I wanted to write something about like what it is when your life splits in half and you have to figure out who you are now that you've mm -hmm. been through this event. I've had people be like, you know, this is too much for kids. And I'm like, is it though? Have you looked nope. at the last two years? Have you looked at ah, these seriously. kids have been through? And also like to that note, you know, when people are like, oh, you, it's going to be too scary. You can't write scary things for kids. Like kids have lockdown drills, guys. Like yeah. there's nothing I could write that would be fucking scary. Seriously. Then they're fucking lockdown drills. I remember sneaking a copy of a Christopher Pike novel from my sister's room. Um, and it was like, I think it was sorry, wrong number. I still remember the girl in the bed, like crouching with the with the rotary phone i read it and it was this I, if i'm thinking of the right one it was this toxic guy in high school i was 11 and i read it and it was really scary about a year and a half later i recognized those exact same behaviors in a human in my neighborhood and i'm like i'm gonna avoid that person mm. scary well, books help kids this is what i always say when people are like you know like what, what can't you write? What can you write? I'm like, listen, the, the whole, the thing you have to understand is that this is these scary horror books for kids are a place to practice being brave. It's a safe yes. space Ooh. to oh, yeah. manage so your good. fear. And yep. it's like, I make a pact with my readers. I'm like, I will bring you into the dark and it's going to get scary, but I promise you by the end, we will be back in the light. And that is the deal I make every time. Mm. I will not end a middle grade book bleak. I feel differently about YA. You can be bleak with them but I won't do it with middle grade because I won't yeah. destroy the magic. The way I always look at it is that like, I give them a sword to go slay imaginary monsters so that later in life, when the real monsters appear, they will recognize them. And that's, so that's what good. it does. Ellie, it's, I just got chills. Forgive me. Your father passed away after this appearing house was published, correct? No, before. How has your writing about trauma or grief changed since Big Ron, as my sister and I put it, graduated Shady Pine? <laughs> I'm stealing that. You have to yeah. laugh about it. Jesus. All yeah, right. you do. You Sorry. do. I was in final edits with This Appearing House. Actually, I was on deadline with This Appearing House when my dad died. He died in March of 21. And then This Appearing House came out in August of 22. So yeah, I was... Mm -hmm. So I was still doing like edits. I mean, I didn't because I was like, Sarah, I can't... I have to... I have to go grieve and oh, stare absolutely. at the wall for like yeah. a, probably a couple months. And she was like, take all the time you need. Because my editor's great. Shout out to Sarah. Sarah Schoenfeld. Woohoo! She's, uh, yeah, she's fantastic. She's lovely. Agents, if you're listening, send her books. Oh, um, good plug. Yeah, no, seriously, though, you know what I love about Sarah? Because I hear people talk about their fear of the edit letter. And so I, got, I was like, oh, God, oh, God. I got my first edit letter for Ghost Girl. And every one of Sarah's comments were literally like, a hundred things I love. And then, I don't know, but maybe what if kind of we just tweak just a little bit. And I was nice. like, okay. And it, yeah. Literally, she's never had a harsh comment come out of her. She's amazing. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Dream editor. Because I'm very like, so this is a story about a girl whose grandfather dies. And my dad to my nieces and nephews, they called him Opa. Mm -hmm. And that's what I named the character. And it's very mm -hmm. much based on my father. So I had the first half done and I had some beta readers read it. Um, my very good friends, Amber and Allie. Allie sent me back notes. And she highlighted all of the places that she was like, you're hurting me the most. And every single line that she highlighted was a thought that I had about my dad. Mm. Every single one. One of the things that I put in the book, which I put in the book that I always say is that like, 
when my dad died, I feel like I wrote a story. And in that story, my dad died. But now the story's over. So I'm like, where are you? Like, we did this part. You're supposed to come back now. Which is like an extremely juvenile way of thinking. But it's truly the way I think about it. And, you know, it's funny. Someone in our grief group had this great comment about how the worst part of their mom's death was that her mom wasn't there to make her feel better about it. And I'm like, yeah, that's it. Okay, dad, where where are you? There are moments in the book where like my main character feels like if she opens the door to the right room, she'll find him. And like, that's very much how I feel. Like, it's just a matter of patching it on time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's completely fucked. I need a therapist. No, I just have a question thinking about sort of with my coach hat on a little bit. And also as somebody who very different kind of grief. I mean, Erica knows Ali, I am a foster parent and we had a, a, a long-term foster who went back to his bio mom. He ended up coming back to us six weeks later. So, but like went through the grieving process with him and then it's all kind of weird. But I'm wondering if you have been able to create for yourself a way to kind of come in and out of the story, like a, like a, Hmm. on the days where the writing is too hard, a way to give yourself like the extra space and like self-care and not in like the cheesy self-care way, but like the genuine, like giving yourself space so that you can like be in a, a sad story, but then have that not completely take over. When it's too, it's a too sad dad day. And uh, I just, I'm like, I don't want to write this book because I'm sad. I will, I usually write very linear, but I have been skipping around with this one and writing like little side stories where I'm like, okay, you know what? Today, all we care about is the horror. How scary can I make this seem? Because that's Mm, the great thing about horror is like horror lets you, you can tuck these really hard emotions, these really intense feelings, these really huge life things into horror in a way that like it's escapism at the same time. With this book, I'm like, okay, how scary can I make the scene? Like, how spooky? And I know my editor's going to be like, Mm-mm, dial it down. <laughs> she, always, she always does. I had to fight for those teeth. I did. Ew. I did. She was like, um, because I'm reading through, I'm reading through to like now write the second half. This one's going to be all eyeballs and tongues. So that's fun. You're into body horror. I am. Speaking of scary things, I would like to pivot. 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 Ah. To uh, talking about StokerCon, named after the one and only Bram Stoker, author of Dracula? Is that right? Sure is. Everybody, I want to add that Ellie Malanaiko was a finalist for this year's Bram Stoker Award. Thank you very much. If you don't know, uh, you will know because it's fucking huge. Tell us about StokerCon. Tell us about Bram Stoker, whatever you want. Yeah. Okay, well, I will tell you one thing. I have thrice failed at reading Dracula because I just couldn't get into the story. So I got the audiobook and it's working. I have one major complaint and there's not enough Dracula in Dracula. Really? You see him in the beginning and then it's just like, well, for me now, hours and hours and hours of like not Dracula. Jesus. And I'm just like, bring back the Dracula. Maybe he was vamping in another room. <laughs> <laughs> the Bram Stoker Award is the highest horror award for writing. So they have categories in Every every category you think of, poetry, short stories, novels, first novels, screenwriting, mm-hmm. YA, and up until this year, they never had middle grade. Oh. Because mm-hmm. I don't censor any of my feelings, apparently. I was like on Twitter adding the Horror Writers Association, being like, where's the middle grade category? Why don't you have a middle grade category? And a bunch of other middle grade writers that I know started doing it too. And I don't want to say we did it, but we definitely gave them shit about it. Oh, and then they were like, bing, bang, boom, middle grade category. How many nice. of you were there in that horde? Uh, of people complaining? Yeah, yeah, n- n- poking well, at them, was... nudging about it. So I'm part of a group called uh, the Spooky Middle Grade. So plug for Spooky Middle Grade. We Without offer that. free half an hour author visits, online author visits for librarians and teachers. Yeah. So you get four authors and your kids can ask us any questions they want about writing, about publishing. My favorite question was how I felt about corgis. They were 10 out of 10, by the way. <laughs> Love a corgi. <laughs> How do you so feel about corgis? If you are a teacher or a librarian and want us to do a visit, and also spooky books are year round, not just for Halloween, but in both. Yes. So there were a bunch of us from that group mm-hmm. that were like, what about middle grade? It's <laughs> not fair. Because I always use my patented argument that I make is that A, I don't think everyone should be 11 years old like I was in reading Stephen King. And like B... When people are like, oh, like when I had adult horror writers been like, well, when are you going to write like an adult horror? And I was like, listen. When are you going to write a real horror book? When are you going to write a real horror book? Like a really scary book. You're going to have readers yeah. because I'm giving them to you. Yes. I'm getting kids hooked on horror. I'm yes. getting kids into it. And that's wow. why when they grow up, they're going to read your damn book. So you can feel free to send me money anytime now. 
I love you so much. Snaps. <laughs> Stoker was like, we're going to do middle grade. And everyone was like, ah. and here's how you get on the Stoker ballot. Cause it's, it's cuckoo bananas. You have to be nominated by someone else five times in a row five. or nope. During the course of like this, like from when they're like, we're opening up the awards. It's usually like eight months. Five people have to be like, this go onto their computer and be like this appearing house by Ali Malinenko. Five oh. different humans have to do that. And then you get, if you get the five nominations, you get added to the long list. Now the All long right. list can be like 10, 15 people. And then that gets judged by whoever is the judge of that group to shorten it to the short list. You're only a nominee if you make it on the short list. The short list is mm. five writers. So I made the short list. I was officially a nominee. So I went to Stoker and didn't win, which was fine because I didn't think I was going to. I was really just happy to be there. The day that I was walking, I had to run to the grocery store. because We forgot something for dinner and I was coming back with it and I was listening to music and my phone just ding, 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 ding. It was my most beloved group chat screaming. You made it, you made it, you made it. And I was like, what? What are we talking about? And she was like, the fucking Graham Stoker Award. And I saw, like, she mm. sent me the list and I saw my name on the list and I immediately burst into tears. Shit you not, I ran home. Scared the crap out of my husband. I started just <laughs> screaming. I got nominated. <laughs> and that is the moment I will always remember. Getting on the very first, like the ground floor, very first middle grade. Mm. When people say it's an honor to be nominated, I tend to believe them. It, it truly is. I was very nervous beforehand. Uh, anxiety was like on a yeah. like keyed like, up hello. to like 110. Yeah. Aww. Yeah. It's like, knock, knock. I'm coming in. But once I got there, I was better. And I think it's a beautiful segue what you just talked about. So like you today, who is a Bram Stoker Award finalist, what advice do you have to previous you from five years ago? Oh, that's a great question. Right. Also, it's that I think you're the first person who's ever said that in conjunction with my name and the real. Ooh, so uh, you have an agent. You are getting rejected by everyone in publishing. <laughs> it's pretty bleak. <laughs> you are pretty unhappy. So I guess I'm just going to tell you that if you can just find the story that you know you have, you'll be really, really, really happy in January of 2019 because <laughs> you're getting the call. It's coming. I love that. And now we're going to time travel in the other direction. So I want you to imagine it's 2028, five years oh. in the future. Oh, Jesus. What is that version of you? What advice does she have for you today? Oh, she'll probably tell me to take better care of my knees. I hope that she tells me that I have finally taken to heart the advice I tell everyone else, which is that you can only control how hard you work. And that you have to let go of all of the publishing things you can't control. And that the story is the only thing that matters. Hmm. And I hope I believe that by then. Oh. <laughs> because I do, I mean, I do believe that. And I tell people it all the time. And I'm like, all that matters is those early morning hours that I sit by myself with the dawn coming up and my mm. little writing desk, no longer in a closet, in a nice room, fairy lights up and the posters of my two published novels in front of me. And it's my time. It's mine. I get two hours and then, and then the day can do whatever it wants. But this is mm. my time and this time is precious. And this is where this is where the magic is. You know, storytelling, it just makes empathy. It makes me be mm. a better human. Like you put a story out into the world and you were like, here, I felt this thing. Does anyone know what this feels like? And then someone on the other side of the world is like, Oh, I know that thing. I feel yeah. that too. And then you feel less alone. That's the whole point of storytelling is to mm, feel yeah. less alone on this very temporary ride we're on. I think the secret desire of publishing for a lot of us is like that connection of being able to like connect with other humans. And sometimes it's in languages. You don't, you don't even speak the same language, but you have the same feeling. It's magic. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's pure magic. So before we have you tell us where to find you, let's let us know where, what do you have coming out next? I'm working on the middle grade book, but um, the next thing that is definitely coming out that's been announced is an adult contemporary, no, excuse me, historical book. So it's like oh. way out of my normal world of middle grade horror into um, adult. And it's called, I, I co-wrote it with two of my friends, uh, Linda Epstein right, and, and Liz Parker, and it's called The Other March Sisters. It is a story about... Amy, Meg, and Beth set in the world of Little Women, but from their points of view. So yeah, I think about that. Isabel, thank you for including that question. <laughs> Ellie Melanenko, this has been an absolute freaking pleasure. Where can our listeners find you? I'm definitely on Twitter, probably more than I should be. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just at Ellie Melanenko. And I'm on Instagram with the same at Ellie Melanenko. And 
I am on, on my website is alimalanico.com and my two books are out in the world if you want to read them. You got it. Thank you very much, Ali. Yeah. This has been wonderful, guys. This was so much fun. Okay, bye. Welcome to the okay. Cuckoo Banana Show with Ali Malanenko, <laughs> Isabel Sterling, and Erica Davis. <laughs> la, 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 la.